Hello everybody, welcome to another edition of Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour. Um, as you've noticed already, we have these ongoing issues sometimes whereby Facebook seems to decide that we have to go to friends rather than public. I've now overrode that, so it's all working properly and everything else. Right. Today's guest is somebody that uh, I've met on a couple of occasions back in the past. Whenever I travel up to Scotland, um, I've been invited at two or three occasions now to the Scottish Society for Psychical Research, and I thoroughly enjoy um, going up there. And I've only recently discovered, funnily enough, that um, um, I did some DNA tests, as you can do, and I've discovered that I'm... I'm uh, 38% Scottish so I was quite pleased about that in, in many ways <laughs> so the one thing I have discovered that the one thing I am is a full-blooded Celt I'm Irish Welsh and Scottish <laughs> so so I, I'm, the, I'm the real deal when it comes to that um, but whenever I go up there I've, I've always meet up with a group of people up there and one of the people I always have fascinating discussions with is today's guest Trisha Robertson um, Trisha is I don't know if Trisha would um, agree with me on this, but I always find Trisha very impish. She has an incredible sense of humour, probably a very fun sense of humour as well. And I think she's one of these people that she's just wonderful to talk to. Um, and as we were just discussing before we started, one of the major issues is both of us are very, very open minded about strange phenomenon. We know it happens. And the question is why it happens and what is really going on. And Trisha is somebody that has really, really spent the last 30 years going to great detail about this. And just before we started, I was asking her um, how she ever got into this. And we already started in this fascinating discussion. So Trisha, without further ado, welcome to the Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour. And can we continue with the conversation? So what was it that made a physics teacher um, suddenly become fascinated by a paranormal phenomenon? Well, it's a very boring answer. I don't know. Um, everything in, in my life was wonderful at the time. I was married, I had two children, two cars, lovely house. And uh, for some unknown reason, I began to look at uh, the paranormal. I don't know. It's just something that came into my mind to look at. Uh, I, and it, the good thing is I didn't come in through any loss of anyone that I loved. and. Uh, my life was wonderful at the time. It was just an intellectual interest. And if these things are true, and uh, I'm not bore you with how I started doing that, following people about, and uh, then the more you get into it, the more you realize, well, there's something in this. That's what science does. Science says, well, there's something in this. Uh, when you find something you don't understand, and that, when you ask that question, that's the beginning. And once you start asking the question, things get thrown in front of you for you to investigate further. And that's really the boring answer as to how it started. Well, I know from your books, you've had some extraordinary experiences. Now, I was rereading in research a book that um, we swapped our books a few years ago, Things You Can Do When You're Dead. And literally, I found the hairs on the back of my head, what little hairs are on the back <laughs> of my head these days, rising up. Um, because your writing is just so real and it is so visceral and it really is just genuine. And I think that is so powerful. So after 30 years of doing all this and researching it and everything else, have you come to any conclusions, do you think, as to yes. what is really going on? Uh, as Archie Roy, a, a colleague, would have said, uh, this is my opinion at this time, at this moment in time, with what I've seen and done so far. Um, I am a pragmatist. I, I have no a artistic merit whatsoever so and they, I should I think I should have been a lawyer probably rather than a maths and physics teacher because everything has to make sense to me you have to join the dots there's nothing airy fairy about it and I should just say now that anything I do and say has nothing to do with any religion and yet if it's all true which it is it affects it or it incorporates within every religion it's all the same under different headlines. But we don't need to employ a theist theory for it at all. We look at what happens and then we take that further. If it happens, then what are the possible reasons? What can we conclude from this? And that's basically what I do. In, in our world, there are two methods of proof that we accept in our society. And one is as in a court of law beyond reasonable doubt. And the other one is proof the only proof you really get is in mathematics and science when you have a theory and you can bear that out every time. And that is scientific and mathematical proof. 
that itself is, can vary a little, but that's what you would call scientific proof in the mathematical side. The other one, beyond reasonable doubt, as we all know, through the years, people have lost their lives over jury trials beyond reasonable doubt. And the evidence that we look at has to be that beyond reasonable doubt. And it depends very much on where you look for your evidence and who you're listening to and who you're investigating as to what conclusions you can come to. The skeptic will never find any proof because they will not address the best cases. They just won't look at it. Years and years ago, Archie Roy was in our radio program with uh, Sue Blackmore. It was called Head to Head. And they were discussing evidence for life after death. And uh, Sue was going on saying there was no evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And Archie said, well, what do you think about a particular case? And he named a particular case. And she went, oh, I don't know that one, and carried on with something else completely. Well, you see, that's not an attitude. That's not even a scientific attitude at all. You have to look at, at what is being reported and then have a look at it and decide for yourself. It is in as a, a good a manner of proof as you possibly can. But the trouble with the paranormal is it's got such so many different topics. Well, for example, we've got um, a, a reincarnation, you've got near-death experience, you've got electronic voice phenomena, you've got mediumistic information, you've got apparitions, materialization, poltergeist activity, which is not always to do with consciousness, right enough. There are so many avenues that you have to uh, home in on one at a time and decide where that leads you. And then when it all, what I do is I look at a lot of phenomena and then gather from that the, the seeds of that. And in the best possible cases, the only conclusion you could come to is that can only happen if the consciousness of that person survives. No one else knows that information, not even the person getting the information. So where does information come from? And that's that's my, one of my gold nuggets. Where does that information come from? And it can't always be from this mysterious Akashic record that people speak about. One would assume if there is an Akashic record, and let's say, for talking sake, it's a quantum or a digital library somewhere. Each of our actions just now, somewhere, for whatever reason we don't know, that's logged in a library, a digital or a quantum library. Well, when you die, the actions you've had here would surely not be recorded in a quantum library or a digital library. But in one of my very, very best cases, uh, that it was one I uh, researched myself, uh, I, I'll just tell you the case and then you can decide if it's a Please library or not. Do. This is one of, it's one of these cases you investigate and as you're doing it, you don't really believe it yourself, but uh, you know it's happening, you know it's true. About, um, it was uh, near 2000, near 2000, a woman came to me and she wanted to speak to me about the de her death of her daughter. Now, I didn't know this woman. She doesn't live in the same place that I do, but people find me, no doubt people find both of you. And she found me and I met her and she, she was telling me that her daughter had been murdered. And of course, it didn't mean anything to me. And I realized right away she was wanting me to get a reading with a medium for her because I study mediums. I don't follow them, I study them. And uh, I said to her, well, in my own mind, I thought, well, your daughter's been murdered six months ago. And the woman felt that the police weren't making any headway at all with this um, murder case. They really weren't. They were very nice to her, but they weren't making any headway. And I thought, ah, you want a reading with a medium, but I'm not going to do that. Because if your daughter's been murdered, a reading with a medium might not be the most helpful thing. So I said to her, can you bring me an envelope, a sealed envelope with something belonging to your daughter? And I'll take it to various people and get them to psychometrize. For anyone that doesn't know, psychometry is when you put your hand in something and you can get an impression of what's in the envelope and how it relates to a particular person. And she said she would do that. So at some point she brought me the next week, she brought me an envelope, an A5 brown envelope. I can only describe it as bumpy. It wasn't a watch, it wasn't a ring, it was bumpy, just nothing, all sealed. And it didn't matter, I have no, I have no clue. I don't know about the murder. I don't even, uh, uh, she may have told me her daughter's name, but uh, I know nothing about the murder. And neither did she, of course, the daughter was just found murdered. 
So I took it to a couple of mediums and they said bits and pieces about this ring. One said uh, that, it, that it, uh, it was a murdered girl. They, both, they all got that. It was a, a girl that was murdered. And it, the, the, bizarrely, the day she was killed, she was at the dentist that morning. And that turned out to be true, actually. But that was one person. Another person gave me other things about a black taxi and a green car and different things. But nothing you could really hang your hat on. So I took it to this third medium, not all on the same day, of course. I took it to a medium that I know very well as a, a, a reasonable medium and a person whom I was able to walk into their home. So on another day, and I remember it was the time I had my one and only BMW driving into the driveway with my BMW with my brown envelope clutched in my hand. And so I just rang the bell and said I was coming in. And the person was sitting at a very large desk with a computer in one hand and a cigarette in the other hand. And as I walked in, the person said, oh, hello, Tricia. Hiya. And I went, hi. And I just plonked this envelope down and I said, can you tell me what you can get from this envelope? And the medium said, do I have to? And I went, yeah, you have to. So grudgingly, very grudgingly, because it was me, the medium put the cigarette down and put the hand on the envelope. And immediately, and if I say a nanosecond after putting, the, the, the medium sitting glowering at me, in a nanosecond, the medium looked in, straight into my eyes and said, I've got a girl here that was murdered and uh, she's got medium uh, length brown hair. Well, I don't know that. And the medium gave me tw 29 pieces of relevant information relating to this girl. Some of the things she said was my boyfriend, and she named him, was the first person to know I was dead and he phoned my mother. She said, my mother has moved my photograph from the top of the mantelpiece to the top of the television today. She said she described her body. She said that she had two tattoos, two heart shaped tattoos on her left breast intertwined and the colors of that on her left breast. She had another tattoo in the back of her right arm in the form of a rose in different colors. That was OK. And then bizarrely, she said she, she's telling me she misses her three cats. Now, this is like a three week conversation like us sitting here. Mm. It was just like. Oh, she's telling me she's laughing, but she misses her three cats. She's telling me she lived in a cul-de-sac. She lived one up on the right-hand side. And uh, I'm trying to remember all the things that said now. And uh, all the newspaper reports of her clothing she was found in were all wrong. And uh, she's telling me, now I'm not going to get the details right on here, but it's all, all in the book. She's telling me she was wearing a pink top, a grey skirt and ankle boots. And what they said in the paper was blah, blah, blah. And that was totally wrong. Now, you have to realise at this point that I don't know any of this. The medium doesn't know it. The medium didn't know I was coming in to put a hand uh, on an envelope. I just went along just basically because I wasn't getting much else from the other mediums. Now, what else? Oh, yeah, this, this was the cracker. This was a clincher. Now, I don't know anybody that's ever been in jail, ever. I don't really know the names of jails anywhere. And then the medium's looking and smiling and saying, oh, she's telling me that when she was younger, she was in Contonville prison. And I think I am sweary word in my head saying, oh, my God. Well, I, you know, I've got the bland face. I'm recording it and I'm writing it all down as well. And as I'm writing, I'm thinking, well, that's either true or it's not true. It's certainly not something you could glean out of nowhere. She was in Cordonville prison when she was younger. And she's telling me she also had a termination of a pregnancy when she was younger. I'm trying to think what else I've missed out. It'll come to me in a minute. Uh, so that was the, 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 the tattoos. Um, I can't just remember the rest of it. But that was the prison for me was, was the nub of it all. Um, a cat's, the boyfriend, the mother the movement of that. If I remember anything else, I'll tell you in a minute. Anyway, so I write, I'm writing it all down. And of course, I just thank you, thank you very much. Told the medium nothing. We had a cup of tea and I went home and transcribed it all into 29 individual. Oh, why? She gave a description of her murder. 
she said that she was a it was a it was a cloth round the back of her neck and it was two men that murdered her not one and she gave a slight description which i'm not going to give you of the two men um a, one was asian and one was a white guy and she described them and the, the, she didn't mention a taxi then no she didn't and she described all her injuries were down the back down her back so i'm just i'm taking it home i have i have no idea if this is right it could be the biggest load of twaddle ever because it meant nothing to me and absolutely nothing to the medium who didn't really want to do it in the first place so after i got home i transcribed it all into 29 individual statements you know for example she had two hearts entwined uh, uh, you know on her breast the colors were you know blah de blah de blah the mother moved her photograph from the fireplace, blah, blah, blah. So that was okay. I haven't a clue. So I phoned the mother, I must have had a number, and agreed to meet her two days later. And I agreed to meet her in her own house, which I'd never been to. So two days later, I went to the mother's house. Uh, in trepidation, I might say, and they went in, made me very welcome. And as I walked into the lounge, I noticed a photograph of a girl on top of the television. And I said, Oh, is that your daughter? She said, yes, I just moved her picture there from there two days ago. And I thought, OK, here we go. <laughs> so I said, no, I'm going to read you statements that I just said mediums have made to me. And I, they may be absolutely wrong. And if they're wrong in any way at all, tell me they're wrong. It doesn't matter. We just want to get something here. So I started off with she lived in a cul-de-sac. One, one floor up on the right hand side and so on. She had three cats. Now, who knew she had three cats? Uh, the boyfriend was the first one to know that she was murdered. He phoned the mum and then it came to a, as well as the other things, the clothing uh, that I said, hey, what, what clothing, you know, was she found in? And the mother said, oh, the newspapers are all wrong and what I had was absolutely correct. And then I came to a uh, one medium said that uh, she'd been in Quantum Real Prison when she was younger. She said, Oh, yes, that's right. And I'm thinking, Holy, you know what? And uh, I didn't tell her about the pregnancy because a psychical researcher has to be responsible. And I thought, You've just found out your daughter's been murdered. You might not have known she was pregnant, if, you know, before that. So I chickened out. If you want to say chickened out, I did chicken out. And I didn't tell her about the men, or the cars were mentioned in that as well, different cars. Oh, and, and an address at Dumbarton Road in Glasgow was also mentioned. But I didn't give the mother any of that information uh, because I didn't feel it was right to do so. But of the 29 pieces of information that I had gleaned from the medium, I only told the mother 22. But I counted the other, being fair, to science, if you want to say, I, which it wasn't really fair. I didn't, I, I included the others as being wrong in my statistics. I couldn't just leave them. I, I didn't want to say she got 22 out of 22, which, which, which she did. So I just counted the others. I didn't even count them as I don't know. I can't be bothered with these medium, and somebody's going to argue, I can't be bothered with these mediumship experiments when they say it's right, it's wrong, or it's a wee bit right. How would you estimate that bit? Oh, yeah. No. For me, I'm a black and white person, as you know, Tony. Mm. And it's either right or it's wrong. In these cases, there's nothing in between. So... Okay, so that's basically what happened with that. But how the heck do you allow for that? What scientific parameter that we live by allows for that thing to happen? That's exactly as it happened. No frills, nothing uh, mysterious about it at all. And as I say, with the other thing, the girl, this was not this medium, but she did go to the dentist that morning that she was murdered, which is totally a bizarre piece of information. So, so there's no there's no possibility here. I mean, the medium in question was somebody you you knew. Oh yeah, you knew, you knew quite well. You knew the medium quite well. Yeah, yeah. But the medium had no idea that you were going to be turning up that day, at all. No. Okay, so it's not as if she or he or whatever was able to prepare or research. And even no, if they neither could, could I. I didn't know anything about it. Yeah, even if they could research, this this stuff would not be available. 
on the web. It's not oh. as if somebody could find it anywhere. No. So this is quite intriguing, isn't it? Do you know if this medium person was always as successful as this? Or was this a one-off as far as you're concerned? Well, I, 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 can't, I can't answer that, obviously, but I know the medium is an extremely good medium, yes. Because that is extraordinary, isn't it? You know, the, the yeah, amount of... But, but the, the question we have to ask ourselves in consciousness is mm. a, it, it, that couldn't come from a static Akashic record on your life. Correct. Because and that's a, going to be an, my next there's question. An, there's here. an ongoing, there's a, a coming and going. And it was the way the medium was uh, talking to me. We had, mm -hmm. a th I had, we had a three way conversation, although I didn't actually speak, of course, directly to this particular girl. Oh, and her appearance was correct as well, the hair mm. and everything like that. So, uh, you know, when, just before we start getting into the, the philosophy uh -huh. and the possibilities of this, the medium presumably was in. Well, it was psychomet it was psychometry, wasn't it? Uh -huh. So she was just feeling something, and she was getting this information from something physical. Yeah, well, that it belonged it, to the girl. If you if you do psychometry, um, that just if you want to say tunes you in right. to, to whatever level that particular girl's at, or or anybody, you psychometry. It, it, in the old sense, you psychometrize an item, a ring, and that tells you it was your granny's ring and all the rest of it. But to me, all of these things are tools, whether they're yeah. ribbons, colors, tarot cards, uh, psychometry. It just, see, whatever happens in a medium's brain, it just seems to get them to the, it's like tuning your television, yeah. BBC one, BBC two, and immediately, and that girl must have, well, she must have known it, it because because it was an ongoing thing that, well, she didn't know me, that, that something was going to happen that day. And it was animated. It wasn't stilted. It was an animated conversation. Uh, so, but, so how do you allow for that? There's the mm -hmm. only, only way you can falsify that is by saying that we're all lying. And I can mm -hmm. assure you 100% nobody's lying. I knew nothing. The mm -hmm. medium knew nothing. So where did this correct information come from? It can't even come from the mother because she's completely somewhere else. She doesn't know I'm going to see a medium at that particular moment in time. And the fascinating thing, isn't it? The way in which it seems that the girl was witnessing what her mother had been doing that morning in terms of moving the photograph. Yes. So it's evident that there is some form of aware consciousness that is existing in some kind of non-physical form that can both see things without eyes because, you know, the, mm -hmm. she's dead, but she's somewhere else, but can view in and can choose to be in a particular location, mm -hmm. which effectively gives the idea, isn't it? That she was kind of hanging around her mother's house trying well, to... she probably would be if, if there's not a resolution to the... Now, yeah. the next question you're going to ask me, I know you are, is did I go to the police? And the answer is I would have. The, the, it was a police a woman, I don't know who she was, had been dealing with the mother for the past six months and she was terrific with her. We could have taken that to her, but that very week, it was a new police person that took over the case. And I thought, if I take this to the police, they'll think I'm a nutter. So I didn't. And uh, to this day, a man, a man was actually tried and found not proven, but um, it, I, I think it was, it was obviously wrong. It wasn't anything like anything that we had on that. And I didn't want to be giving names addresses not names but addresses to the police and, and just in case it was wrong but all of those other things the ongoing things the cats uh, the movement the, the the boyfriend was the first to know that he was dead then the movement of the photograph and there's something i've forgotten but i'll maybe remember it later because this is not like what i know when i normally discuss cases like this i have the impression that when i work with mediums you know that i feel that they go into some kind of hypnagogic state and in the hypnagogic state, they communicate and they see things, you know, and they'll see flitty, fleeting images and everything else. But this wasn't seeing fleeting images. Nope. This was literally, literally the word medium, which mm -hmm. is that the medium was acting as a medium mm -hmm. of communication between you exactly. and a sentient being yeah. that passed over. Yeah. And and in, in in the now, as it were, you know, it's it's not a it's nothing remote. It's it's in the mm. now, the conversation was dynamic. That's the word I'm looking for. It was a dynamic conversation between the three of us, although I never spoke. I was just listening and writing down and recording all that was being said. Now, I'll be, as I'm doing it, I'm actually 
not believing this is happening. It was just, and I thought, especially with the prison, I thought, well, that's either true or it's not true. So that's something that the true skeptic, a skeptic in the right sense should be looking at. Mm. Where, did, where did this information come from? Who had this information? There's only one. Because this would be an, a fascinating opportunity, wouldn't it, if you could communicate with somebody like this under these circumstances and ask them, can you tell us more about the environment you're in? You know, um, well, that wasn't my are. that wasn't my purpose that particular mm. day. And you've you've got to be very careful with environment. The one thing uh, in all of this is there are no experts. Nobody knows everything. In fact, we know very little. All we can do is investigate it from different avenues. Sarah does it from her avenue, anthropologically, which is fantastic. It's something that, that should be done in this area. But my take on this at the moment is everybody's experience is slightly different. So although she was able to tell us maybe what she could see, hear, or do, that might have absolutely no bearing on what somebody else can see, hear, and do. Mm -hmm. all, we, all we can say is that the there is a consciousness, a living consciousness, a in the now dynamic consciousness, which can communicate with those still here. It, and it can, it's a self-aware consciousness. It's the aware of its own ego. Totally, totally self-aware and totally self-aware of the what's happening in the lives of people that they love. And mm -hmm. uh, th I'll tell you another another one that's it, it's it's bizarre, but it is from the consciousness of someone who was actually passed over. You probably remember that from the first book. It's someone that uh, it's someone I I was phoning a particular place for something I can't even remember. And this person answered the phone and said, is that you, Trish? And I went, yeah, who is it? And the person is a man. He said, and I said, oh, my goodness, I haven't seen you for years. And he said, I was trying to get a hold of you anyway. He said, I had an experience. Now, I trust this person. I hadn't seen him for years. He's got no reason in the world to lie to me whatsoever. And this man owns a shop. And uh, it, one day he was, uh, it, it, well, it, it, I'll go back the other way. He, he sent his family away. He lives in a big, big red sandstone house, big high ceilings. And he sent his family away on holiday so he could decorate. So he was in his own in this big, big house with 20 foot ceilings, um, painting the ceiling in actual fact, with the, the ladders up near the roof. He's painting away at the ceiling. And where he was, if you're painting a ceiling, what your head's about, a foot, maybe six inches under the ceiling. So he's painting away in a corner. And all at once, for no reason at all, he looked over at the same level as him. And there was a man materialized beside him under the ceiling. Now, not a whole man, half a man. He had on, bizarrely, a cap, what we call a bonnet, a cap. He'd on a, a, a green tweed jacket, a shirt and a tie. And he recognized this man as a customer who had died six years earlier. And it was, he had little round cheeks uh, and the man was pointing at him and saying, tell them not to do it. Everything's going to be OK. And of course, you can imagine his language. Um, he, he, he was stunned and he blinked his eyes and looked and the man was still there saying, tell them not to do it. Everything's going to be OK. And the man just went poof, disappeared. Well, you can imagine the thoughts that went through this chap's mind. He said, I do not know how I got down that ladder. I had to come down and sit in the chair. There was a few swear words in there. I had to sit in the chair all night. I couldn't even move to get myself a cup of tea. So this led to a dilemma with him because this man, it, the man wasn't old by the way, he was only 56. And uh, this led to a dilemma because tell them not to do it. The man's wife came into the shop on a regular basis. So the man was obviously giving him the message to tell the wife. And uh, in sheer self-defense, I wonder what went through his head. It's quite a rough area this, where the shop is, actually. So the next day, the woman didn't come into the shop. The man never appeared again. The next day, the woman did come into the shop. And, and he thought, oh, shit, you know, he, he said, can I talk to you in the back shop, please? Oh, yeah. So and he, he sat her down in a crate of iron brew and he, he told her the story. And he, was, he didn't know what to expect. So she jumped up, gave him a cuddle and kissed him in the cheek and said, thank you very much and went out, said nothing. 
okay, that's fine. Man never came back. I think he told the woman in case the man came back again. That's my own particular feeling because you don't want to be seeing a man 20 feet off the ground when you're up a ladder, especially half a man. Nothing from the waist down, the jacket, and then nothing fully clothed to the to the waist. So two weeks later or so, she came in and said to him, can I speak to you in the back shop? Mm -hmm. She said, I'll explain that now. She said, our son has always been, it was a rough area. Our son has always been in trouble with the police as a juvenile. But her words, the police had fitted him up for something he actually didn't do. And if he was found guilty, he would go to the adult jail. And it, she said, well, we're going to take him to Ireland, yeah. going to smuggle him over to Ireland so he could spend the rest of his life in Southern Ireland and they couldn't touch him. But when my husband said, I've got the shivers, tell him not to do it, it everything's going to be okay. She took the word of that and they took the boy to court whenever, whenever that was. And the, the judge that was there at the time read the papers and said, hmm, no case to be answered here, dismissed. Now, would you take the word of a half materialized man 20 feet up from the ceiling? I don't know. I would. I'll be honest with you. I don't know. But uh, he certainly did. And thankfully, the man never appeared again, much to my friend's uh, uh, pleasure. So there we go. Information that the person receiving information didn't know. And uh, he certainly didn't know and passed on, and it's proved to be correct. Erlander Harrelson had quite a few cases in Iceland of fully materialized people coming to strangers. In Iceland, as you know, a lot of fishermen and a, a lot of young men died in fishing boats, etc. And uh, this was this was a case. It was a young fisherman that had died, and he came to a complete stranger, said who he was, where he lived, who he wanted to contact, and would they please be kind enough to let them know that he's been here. And people are going to ask, well, why did he not go to the people in the same family? And we don't know the answer to that, except that this particular person must have been once again in the same vibe, if you want to, in the same wavelength to get this information. Well, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because in your book, I mean, that, that particular story, uh, I remember that one, yeah. I reread it this afternoon in that yeah. book, and I thought this is extraordinary because it reminds uh -huh. me of the case of the Roman soldiers in York, you know, where they, they saw them marching through the wall. That's, di that's different, Tony. That's different. Because mm. in, the, in the case of the Roman soldiers, there's no interaction. And exactly. That was going to be my point that they were yeah. just an image, like almost yes. stone, stone, it, whereas this person communicated. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why would why would he exaggerate a story or describe a story? The very fact it's so strange makes it more believable. Oh yeah. And again, you know, with the with the uh, Elinda Haraldson work, you mm -hmm. know, I was particularly fascinated by the case of Indrid or Indridison. Yes. And the way in which a leg had a drop in, and the drop in was describing the fire in Copenhagen. Uh -huh. So these things again show that information is is being conveyed. There's a communication taking place. Oh here. yeah. Yeah. which is extraordinary. I'm just going to bring in Sarah here because already I'm I'm saying in my head we're already 40 minutes in and we <laughs> not even done nothing. Started. We have to get you back within the next 2 or 3 weeks for a full 2 or 3 hour discussion. So let's guys out there don't worry we're going to get Trisha back and we'll we'll pull this pull this out completely. Sarah, would you like to make any comments or observations at the moment? Well, actually, I was thinking that because we do only have an hour, I've really enjoyed listening to everything Trisha's had yeah, to say. Yeah, I, I noticed us both there, Sarah. I noticed us both. We were both like this. <laughs> I was totally enthralled. Sarah was prettier. <laughs> no. Yes, um, yes, you're both pretty. Yeah. Yeah, but also, I was thinking um, that, you know, we've interviewed quite a lot of people about paranormal phenomena or psychic mm -hmm. phenomena, and mm -hmm. they don't actually have any or often they don't have any exact examples and you're mm. like, give me example, give me example. And mm. you don't get an example out of them. And so I love Trisha's got some actual examples. That's great. Carry on Trisha. Yeah, that, because this is so, so this is just fascinating. And, and in terms of the flow, I think what we'll do is a sweetener now for, I mean, Trisha, if you can get back in say a fortnight's time on a Monday, we can spend much longer doing this because okay. I think this is wonderful stuff. You know, this is absolutely wonderful. We have we actually haven't started our conversation. No, we haven't. Properly. And I knew I knew we wouldn't. I knew we wouldn't because when we meet, we just talk. Yeah, and yeah. that's the brilliant thing. And what, as Sarah said, is magical about about you is that these are real stories. 
Can I just say accounts, mm. not stories, please? Account. Thank you. Thank accounts, you. yeah, that is true. <laughs> and because you're a mathematician and a physicist, mm. you know, your your world, your, the way you analyse things. Yeah. And I mean, in the book, the amount of times you say in this book and you turn around and you say, we really don't know what's happening here. Mm. You deal with poltergeist activity. You deal mm. with drop-ins. You deal with some extraordinary cases. Mm. And it's intriguing and your point here about the akashic record argument mm -hmm. i'm totally with you on this even yeah. though i would even though it's contradicting my own cheating the ferryman hypothesis <laughs> it's not it, this but, is not what i'm at no it's, it's it's dealing with the facts and what the information is telling us yeah so in terms because of this and because we're going to run out of time one of the things i've always been interested in asking you is of all the cases you've dealt with which was your wow moment? Which was the one where you went, wow, this is just extraordinary? I well, mean, I'm sure you have many, but can you give us a few of them? Well, the, the yeah. one I've just described was the mega wow one, really. Mm. It mm. was absolutely mega wow. The other one that uh, it says, it, when you're doing these things, you don't actually, you don't believe that they're actually happening. Uh, not so much a case, I will I'll, we'll give you a case, but in case anybody that doesn't know me thinks I'm a complete nutter, uh, Archie Roy and I did five years work uh, on a uh, mathematical stuff, uh, testing mediums. We, we tested the hypothesis that all medium statements... Can you just explain who Archie Roy was for the... For the professor list? Archie Roy is Professor of Astronomy and Physics at the University of Glasgow. Archie's a generation older than I am, but... Uh, Whatever, however the world works, we got we got shoved together. We worked together in psychical research. I was good at some things. Archie was good at other things, and we developed um, a set of experiments uh, over five years to test a hypothesis that all medium statements are so general they can apply to anyone. And sadly, that's generally true. The the amount, the standard of really good mediums is very very poor. It really is. It's, I think, about 10% of all mediums are any good, to be honest with you. And in that, and this is the problem, because mm. there's no standard, there's no yardstick. It's all to do with individuals. Anyway, we, we, we thought out this series of experiments, which I'm not going to explain, because we'll be here forever and everyone will fall asleep. But shall we just say that throughout the five years, we organized sessions in different places all over the UK, uh, where by a third party would organize uh, an audience somewhere, anywhere, and they would maybe have between 25 and 40 people. We didn't know who was going to be in the audience. I would bring a medium to the experiments. Archie wouldn't even know who the medium was. And when we got to a venue, Archie or I would number the seats randomly, and only he would know where the seat numbers were in any particular room. And he would make obviously a map of that. Um, so when we arrived, Archie and I would split. I would get the medium, he would be randomizing the seat numbers. When the audience was gathered for one reason or another, they would come in and we had a pack of cards with numbers on the back, say it was one to 40, whatever that was, one to 40. And as they came in, the pack was shuffled for the, for the first person and the person would have to take the go and sit on the seat of that number. If it was number four, that person had to sit in seat number four the whole time, and then and so on and so forth. And of course, you get people say, "Oh, can I not sit beside my husband?" No, you can't. It's an experiment. You know, you're taking part in an experiment. Anyway, then they they would sit there. I would be in a completely different room with a medium. The medium and I would never see the audience. We didn't see the audience. We didn't see the room. But we had a one-way microphone system wherever we went. And I said, I would say to the mediums, this, of course, is an experiment. We don't know if this is going to work. And I would say, what I want you to do, because mediums trust me because they know I'm trustworthy. I would never make a fool of them. And I would say, now, I want, there is an audience through that wall. I don't know who's in it. I want you to tune in and see if you can get information for a sitter. Now, what Archie would do to say there were seats one to 40 and before Archie would even go to the venue, well, we knew there was roughly going to be maybe six readings altogether. He would choose six seats. He would choose, right, I'll ch I want a, a, a message for seat 24, seat six, and so on. So he had a list of seats that whoever parked the bum in that seat was the one that was supposed to get 
the first, call, call it six, the first message. Nobody knew who was going to sit in seat six. Nobody, not even the person that came in and sat on it. And uh, the medium would say, well, I'm getting such and such. And the mediums know I'm black and white. You make statements. I have someone, I have someone's father here, the name's William. You know, he did this and that. He had a, you know, he had a ginger beard and so on and so forth. So the mediums knew to make individual statements. None of this airy fairy nonsense. Anyway, and I would tell the mediums, don't make any more than 30 statements because that didn't suit my mathematics on the sheet. <laughs> And so they made at the most 30, I would go top, top now. And so this was done. There were other protocols as well uh, during the whole thing. So that resulted in three published papers in the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research in London, a peer-reviewed journal. If you're really interested in them, and most people won't be, in the back of all my books is the reference to where you, where you could get the information if you wanted to. But let's just say, after five years work and doing all of this with graphs and statistics and all the rest of it, no one was more surprised than Archie and I when it worked. And in our experimentation using good mediums and our methodology, there is no question that good mediums, even triple, that's, David Fontana said, that's triple blind. Mm -hmm. And even in triple blind conditions, good mediums could give information to a particular person that nobody knew on a particular seat on in every occasion and it worked out so we nullified the hypothesis to 10 to the 10 to the minus 12 was it was a statistic on that being due to chance the work that we did so them's pretty good apples can you baby <laughs> absolutely absolutely i know because could ask, um, sorry, could I just ask Paul? Paul Moran asked an in, interesting question. He said, "From the Sears of the Highlands to modern-day mediums such as Gordon Smith and parapsychology courses at Edinburgh University, Celtic people appear to have a special gift for sci and ESP. Do, do, do you think, Tricia, that there might be a genetic aspect to it?" And I bring in here as well, like you were talking about Iceland, and I know in Iceland there's a general acceptance of seeing oh, yeah. people. Oh yeah, the, the Iceland know all about apparitions because so many young men die. Yeah, they know all about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At Celtic, yes, very probably. And I don't, I don't know, I don't know why that should be. And no one really knows why mediums are mediums. All we can say is that there's something. We've all got governors in our brain. We couldn't remember everything that happened yesterday or the day before because you you would go mad. Your mind, there are governors in your brain that stop you remembering certain things. It appears to me that mediums have some switch somewhere where it's suddenly opened and they can use that switch to communicate with whatever. We'll call it consciousness. I don't like the word vibration. I don't like frequency because we. Do, I think it's a quantum thing. Personally, mm -hmm. I think it's something we cannot understand at this time. But mediums have this thing, and the best mediums are born mediums. They they see they see things from when they were young. Uh, Gordon Smith, for example, he could always see uh, people, but he didn't he didn't think it was anything anything unusual. And uh, Gordon came. He'll tell you himself. He came from quite a rough part of Glasgow, and there were seven children in his family, and his mother was a, a forcible lady, shall we say. So um, when Gordon was very little, four or five, he wondered why all the people were gathered in his house. And uh, then, then later on, he, the mother said something about, oh, hey, Uncle, Uncle Yummy died. And Gordon said, no, I'm just talking to him over there. And he, he got a slap across the cheek for saying that. But he was hurt because he was talking to Uncle Yummy. Um, it's, they have it and we don't. And I'm glad I don't have it because I think it'd be very, very difficult life mm. being a medium. And uh, I know, I know uh, the amount of pressure is putting people like Gordon Smith, Helen Cuthill, Jackie McLeish, all these other, Darren Britton, all these good mediums. Everybody wants something from them. I mean, I have known many, many, many good mediums and I have never once asked them for a reading. Never once. I wouldn't do that. It's not fair it because it, it must be awful for somebody to want something from you all the time and of course they're really they're dealing with life and death and people's emotions i mean i, I have well, i'll give you a quick example uh, not well 
don't think that's an appropriate one, really. I was going to say, Gordon and I, we did go to see Yuri Geller uh, at, um, in Glasgow at the bookshop. And he, Yuri's lovely. I mean, he, he is lovely. And he definitely can bend metal and spoons because I write all about all the experimentation that was done in London. He definitely can do it. I just wish he would be quiet about his aliens because he spoils the whole thing. I, I wrote on his page the other day, Yuri, get a grip. You've got so many good talents. You know, I didn't quite say don't spoil it with all the trivia because it is so talented. Anyway, Gordon had his first book signing. I don't know when that was. And I, he asked me to speak for him. And we'll probably finish with this one because this is a good one, Tony. Um, so it was a very, very small platform we had. There was room for two of us high, high up. And it was the biggest audience that Watersons had had in, in Glasgow. It was packed to the gunnels. And we could only see the tops of their heads. We could see the front row and the tops of their heads. So I did whatever I did, I don't know, introducing Gordon. I was the kudos factor and I gave a little talk. And then Gordon stood up. And if you know Gordon, there's no side to Gordon. He's just very, very normal, very ordinary. And he, he was giving people readings. I wasn't really listening. Then he came to, he said, I'm coming to you, lady with the blonde hair. And he pointed about 10, 12 rows back. The woman's head was down like that. Lady with the blonde hair. And she looked up and a complete stranger. And he said, I've got your son here. And he gave the son's name. And he said, he's wearing a baseball hat round the wrong way. And he's showing, he's lifting up and showing me his hair. And the woman started to laugh. He said, this boy took his own life. He described the, how the boy killed himself. Now, this sounds bizarre, but we're all laughing because it was done in such a way that it wasn't a bad thing. It was done nicely with a three-way conversation again. And the boy, blah, de, blah, de, blah. And uh, the woman said, oh, I was always threatening to go in in the middle of the night and cut his hair off. Can't remember much of the rest of the message but it was all very fun, and the woman ended up smiling, and that the night went on, that was fine. So some of us went round to an establishment round the corner for a drink later, and there was a big table set out, and well, obviously I knew Gordon, and I knew one or two people, but not many. And the lady sat beside me here that I didn't know, and I said, oh, are you with Helen? I, no, no, she said, I'm just here on my own. And I went, you're the lady that got the message about your son. She said, I am indeed. And she said, and I'll tell you one thing, this is the first night in two years that I will have a night's sleep. She said, I'm a Roman Catholic. She said, and when my son took his own life, I went to our priest and he said, oh, well, your son will die in hellfire and damnation and be tortured for the rest of existence. Now, how awful is that? Mm -hmm. She said, tonight, I know that I spoke to my son and he spoke to me and she said, and it was wonderful. So it was amazing, just amazing. That's what they do. That's the power of it, isn't it? That's and the power. Simple. Mm -hmm. They can do it. We can't. Mm -hmm. We can only. We can only. Uh, uh, the, the, one of the things I was going to say earlier was why did I write my books? Well, eventually, uh, Archer Roy and I got together and we gave lectures in Glasgow University in the Department of Adult Education in the university itself. We did that for six to eight years. And well, we worked together at that time, technology was just really coming in. Archie was useless with technology and, and I would prepare the PowerPoint and would do all of that and we would, we would share different things. And we, we came at slightly different standpoints, but it all worked very well. It was a two hour, two hour lecture at a time, you know, for all the weeks and everybody loved it. They absolutely loved it. And of course, by that time I had made a lot of presentations, you know, for, for myself. And when Archie died in 2012 and had so much on a computer. You know, I was I so thought, sad that I just missed him. You know, he died recently when I was up there because I'd love 2012, him. yeah. Well, mm -hmm. nobody saw him because for the, the year before that, he had completely lost, uh, he, uh, he had lost his memory, total dementia for over a year. But we know there's a story about that. We'll do, de we'll do dementia another time. I know that's one of your bags, Sarah, isn't it? Talking about dementia and a memory loss. Anyway, not a sad thing as you think it is. Uh, so I thought I have got all this information about survival, all of it. It would be a sin really not to do something with it. And that's why I decided to do the first book. Mm -hmm. And as you say, I only speak, I only, I'm an ordinary person. I only speak 
I'm a real person. I deal with what happens with people in the real world. I don't try and make it grand. It's, uh, we're only putting down what we know, our experiences at this particular point in time. And there are more and more people working together. I don't care what anyone says. There are more and more people and more and more really groups on Facebook, for example, like Signs of Reincarnation. It's a fantastic group because along with the wonderful information that Stevenson and company, Tucker and Grayson have provided, <clears throat> this group is turning up people writing in are adding to this body of information people giving their that are comfortable to explain their story and try and understand what happened to them with near-death experiences or reincarnation and more and more people are talking about this survival and that's the reason i wrote the book at the first one anyway was to let the man in the street that knows nothing about that they think when you're dead you're dead i'll never see my child again i'll never see my mom again it's to give them hope that and well through experience that these things are absolutely genuine and that is what a pipe and it's for the man in the street uh, that's not eggheads is for ordinary and yet you know the eggheads love my books as well which is really strange because a lot of them know a lot more than I do but they do like it and what you said they like the conversational style there's no jargon there's no uh, initials about things that we don't know anything about and it's real it's just real and it's experience in its life and it happens to us all and i think we all realize through COVID or during COVID that we all need each other we need each other more than we ever thought we would need each other and i think that's a good thing oh totally i agree and that's one of the yeah. things that when we're doing this show you know that we we feel we're linking people and we feel all the time don't we sarah that you know we've got all these little bits of information and if we put them together one day you know we, we'll have an overall picture because Sarah and I, I'd say Sarah's probably similar to myself. I don't have any belief system. I write about certain subjects in certain ways. No, I don't either. But the yeah. evidence, the evidence speaks for itself. And if the evidence speaks... I'm all about the evidence. That's powerful. my motto. And I think your, your point was a very, very valid one, which one we can probably expand upon when we get together next time, is that, you know, within mediumship, there are genuine mediums. And there are an awful lot of people who jump on the bandwagon that may genuinely believe that they have mediumistic skills. Oh, yes. Huh? Deluded I mean, is the word. Deluded. Yeah. I was wondering if there might be an overlap in some instances with uh, what would now be described as bipolar or other mental health conditions that uh, medium, not mediums necessarily, but we've spoken to a lot of people on the show that have been diagnosed as bipolar mm. and have these incredible experiences where they have, like you were describing, this like openness to... Uh, a collective unconscious somehow mm. i don't know i don't i don't know i don't know about i don't know about bipolar I, I couldn't answer that because it's not my area of expertise they may they may well have the switch that clicks and they mm. can do they might well they you might. probably know in my book opening the doors of perception this is one of the things i discuss you know the idea of how the channels of communication be, mm. can be open neurologically mm -hmm. one of the things um i i did two occasions when i was invited to speak at the arthur finley college and you mention arthur finley in, in mm -hmm. your book and it was fascinating there seeing because they train mediums and as you say i don't know whether you necessarily can train somebody because it's something that is innate somehow mm -hmm. And but it was fascinating watching how people see things that I didn't see, you know, that mm -hmm. had physical mediums. They say, did you see how that person's face changed? <laughs> and I was with a previous guest on this show, Dr. Alan Roberts and I were there and we really couldn't see it. Now, I never see I never see it either. Oh, good. Because we couldn't. <laughs> and it's not because we didn't want to no. see it. It just it, it just couldn't see it. That's right. Yeah. You know, and I think, yeah, there's an awful lot of delusion is the wrong term but people genuinely want to do this and it's so important now we're almost at the end of the show now trisha i think it's so important because i will guarantee this will end up being one of my our most popular shows already just because of the way you are it's just something about you and i knew that's why i was looking forward to this show for so long because i know what you're like and how you're just so engaging and so enthusiastic so what we'll do is we'll get you back in the next two weeks for a full two hour even three hour show where we really can drill into this and we'll get people and let people know in advance so they can come in and they can really join well in. i was going to say i mean 
Are you going to let people ask questions so we can address them? Or yeah, what? I think that's yeah. what we need to do. <clears throat> we do have, we, 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 we watch the comments coming in. Yeah. And Sarah does that for me. But I think with this, with your show, I think it's one of the ones where we should really, Sarah, I think you'll probably agree, open the channels and just really have people speak to Trisha about their experiences, their thoughts and feelings. And we'll almost take a back step and just allow people to join in because I'm sure the level of enthusiasm. But for the moment, in terms of people want to know about you and your work. Can you tell us about your website and everything else as well? And your Yes, book? I think you have it on yours. It's a... What is it? www.p. No, it's not p.robertson. That's my, that's my email address. Uh, Trisha Robertson, spelled T R I C I A Robertson. Dot Weebly. Dot com. It's easy. If you see, if you Google me, just put me in Google and you'll get it. No well, what I will do is because this show is all you know, it'll be on my wall now permanently, but also because it's recorded, it will be on my YouTube site. So uh -huh. if anybody wants to, 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 to do this, I will place on the YouTube site the contacts and, and a list of uh, Trisha's books as well. Yeah, so you can I, read them. I think the next time we really need to sit down and explore beforehand the, the various avenues of that show his consciousness exists. I mean, Correct. we've not even touched on electronic voice phenomena. No, we even see, which uh, is fascinating uh, in any itself. Any of these other things. And there's a few developments in that. Not that that's my particular bag, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, because I know Cardoso was doing some very interesting work. Annabella's in lovely. She's lovely. Yeah, I wrote a book with Irvin Laszlo about um, eight or nine years ago, and she supplied us with some fascinating information from that. Yes. The EVP is, is intriguing, and I know my, that... In my third book, I have a little bit about that, and I asked Annabella to do a little bit, you know, just a little finisher summary at the end, and she did that um, in in my book as well. But she she is lovely, but there are other people doing it too, mm. and other people that think they're doing it but not really doing it. But that's a different matter. Yeah, altogether. a lot of it could be pareidolia, and that's the issue, isn't it? You know, and it's oh well, if you can't hear it properly, you know me, it's got to be black or white. Yeah. It's there, or it's not there. And that's what that's but, what um, fascinates yeah. about you. What I tend to do is I do. Someone said to me, "But you only pick the best cases." Yeah, why wouldn't I do that? <laughs> why would I give you a bad case? I only give you the best of the good cases. Is to let people see, and uh, th these things happen, and that's it's exactly what I'm all about. Exactly the point, isn't it? You know, what a stupid statement to make. You know, the thing is... Oh, people have said that. It's crazy, isn't it? You know, Why? it's the best case. And that's what we will always use, you know, because mm. it, it's the the, uh, the 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 black crow or the white swan, isn't white, it? And I white, noticed, you white, know, you're the published. White crow, white crow, darling, white crow. White crow, yes, of course. It is. <laughs> and it's white crow books that publish you as well. And, of course, John, yeah. who's been a previous guest on this, is the yeah. publisher of that as well. And it, it is so important... That these are the outriders. These are the things that will eventually make us realise that our scientific paradigm will change, and the oh, paradigm absolutely. has, absolutely. To, has absolutely. to include all these things. Absolutely. I was just thinking today, actually, about what things in our past have been considered magic uh, and are now scientifically verified that we can use as kind of ca a case study for how our perception of reality has changed well maybe 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 black holes or something to do yeah. with radio even There's radio so yeah I mean, well even I'm, the mobile phone yeah yeah i mean i collect i collect um expedition accounts from i think i've told you this before probably anthony from like the 30s and 40s and a lot of them about early missionaries entering the amazon rainforest mm -hmm. and the tribal people in the amazon thought that they were magicians because they had mirrors and they mm, had these yeah, yeah. artifacts they'd never seen before yeah. and one of my favorite stories from those books is one where um a group of missionaries set up a little cinema in the rainforest and showed these people um the ten commandments with charlton heston and to <laughs> them it was the most magical oh yeah wild absolutely thing that they'd ever seen and it showed these people like uh, I think two, one or two years afterwards, and they've completely converted to Christianity, and they're trying to wear suits in the rainforest, and they, <laughs> you know, they lose their ability to um, shoot arrows within a generation because they've just lost that contact with nature yeah. and their own gods. Yeah. Well, everything and, um, changes. Yeah, everything yeah. changes all it's the time. Strange. You know, it's strange how I guess the the thing with science is often there's this sense that science already has all the answers no. and that's been kind of a constant meme since uh, scientific thought began that they're always know everything 
they, well, they don't. And that, that's the problem where some people, even Archie Roy, I mean, he was a professor of astronomy and physics, and he did know that these things happened because Archie has sat in a circle. Archie has seen a materialized Helen Duncan in, in, in that circle he was in. He's spoken to, to dead people in, in, in these places. Now, Art, but he couldn't say that while he was still operating as a, a lecturer and teacher and professor in the uni. But the minute he became an emeritus professor, that means, as Archie said, uh, you're, not, you're not actually on the staff, but they, they still let you have a room and hope you go away. You know, <laughs> we can't get rid of them. But once he became emeritus and the people, uh, then he would speak out. In the, I mean, his best friend was a astronomer royal for Scotland, John Brown. And John Brown didn't believe a word of this. We even had John Brown speaking to the SSPR about, it was about space and time, actually. We don't just talk about that kind of paranormal. But John Brown, he, he, he could never, it's funny, he just could never, he, he didn't want to think about it. Some people just don't want to think about it. And yet life and death are the most important thing in, in our life and death. They, they are indeed. And yeah. I think that the next show is going to be a classic. So guys, do not miss this one. You're going to have you two, two and a half hours, even three hours. Well, I'm not speaking for two hours on my own. <laughs> you don't need to. You don't need to. But our, our little group is quite garrulous in their own way. And Sarah and I can talk for Britain anyway. So that's not a problem. OK, Tricia, thank you so much for a really, really wonderful. As I said, I just watched Sarah and I both leaning on our hands, just enthralled at the things you were talking about because we just we just wanted to listen so if you can talk for three hours that would be brilliant but i can understand how exhausting that could i can be. do two hours on coast to coast because they have adverts <laughs> yeah or oh, coast to coast drives you mad with the adverts doesn't it well, maybe drives we should get some consciousness hour adverts that would actually be quite a good idea we could just make our own we yeah. could yeah. We could. That's an buy a book, idea, buy Trisha's book. <laughs> yeah, we and Tony's book. book. Sa yeah, yeah. Sarah, Sarah's, Sarah's got a book coming out oh. next year as well. Oh, so, good, Sarah. Good. You know, so we could do that. Okay, everybody, thanks again for watching live here on Facebook. This will be uploaded onto my YouTube channel um, tomorrow, um, and you can watch it. Let your friends know about this. Let's let's make this a really big <laughs> event, um, and we'll I'll announce the date. But I think it's probably going to be too uh, not tomorrow but maybe next monday or the monday afterwards because i'm sure we can do that and i know we've got the available i, I shall i shall check i shall check my my diary as they say anyway yeah, lovely yeah. lovely to see both of you thank you very much and okay. i say we could talk all night but we won't okay good night bye everybody. everybody thanks again bye. for listening again thank you very much